Are you concerned that your child has constipation and looking for some knowledge to empower yourself with possible treatment and prevention strategies? On today's episode, we're going to talk all about um, some of my thoughts on treating and managing the diagnosis of functional constipation. Welcome to the Beehive Doc Talks with Dr. Blair Rolnick. As a pediatrician and mother herself, Dr. Rolnick is here to answer your most pressing parenting questions and guide you through the tough spots. Welcome back to Be Kind Pediatrics. For those of you who are new to the show, my name is Dr. Blair Rolnick. I'm a board certified pediatrician and mom myself. On last week's episode, we talked a little bit about red flag symptoms that are concerning if your child has constipation, that maybe something more serious is going on, and how I make the diagnosis of functional constipation. In today's episode, we're going to talk all about how I approach constipation, my recommendations for treatment. So the first thing I like to preference when I'm talking to families um, who have a child with potentially functional constipation is that the treatment can be very effective, but it takes up to two months to resolve. So let's take a moment here, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how functional constipation occurs and why we choose the treatment pathways we do. So when a stool is moving through your colon and going down to the rectum, um, it bulks up and absorbs water. Once it reaches your rectum, it that is where all of the water or the majority of water reabsorption takes place. So if a stool is sitting in the rectum and not being evacuated, water is reabsorbed and sucked and sucked and sucked out of that stool, making it very, very dry and cement-like, which makes it really hard to pass. One of the messages that your brain receives that it's time to actually take a stool is the stretching of your rectum. Those receptors, however, if they are stretched out for a long period of time, will stop sending that message to your brain. So having a stool sit in the rectal vault makes it harder for you to actually know or for a child to know that they have to go to the bathroom and pass a stool. So you want to get stool out of that rectal vault, not leaving it sitting there, and you need to give the bowel time to shrink down. So I always recommend parents watch a, a video and children, if they're old enough, called Your Poo and You. Um, and it does a really nice job of explaining this, like kind of in this way. So if you think of your rectum as a scrunchie, if it gets stretched out and you leave a scrunchie stretched out, it takes a long time for that scrunchie to stretch back to its normal size. When you take the hair out, it's kind of still stretched out. And that's kind of what happens to your rectum. And so you need to be on an effective treatment for at least two months before you even consider backing off therapy. Again, treatment can be very effective, but it needs at least two months to resolve. And all the symptoms of constipation should be resolved at least for one month before discontinuing any therapy that you've started for constipation. And you need to discontinue that therapy gradually so that your rectum stays nice and small and shrunk down. Now let's jump in and talk a little bit about potential recommendations for treatment that I um, consider for my patients. So for children six months and younger, I'm really careful about making a diagnosis of func functional constipation. If you kind of watched my previous episode, I talked about um, especially those less than one month. That's a big red flag for me that something else is maybe, maybe going on. But in this younger age group, I like to review again, proper formula mixing and preparation with all the baby devices out there that now kind of mix formula for you, there can be places where that goes wrong. And so you really want to be detailed in making sure that the formula is being mixed and prepared correctly. If that is being done appropriately and there is still functional constipation, or I think functional constipation is the underlying diagnosis, I will usually recommend starting um, prunes or prune juice mixed one-to-one -one with water, the dose depending on the age. And I will sometimes discuss um, glycerin suppositories if there hasn't been a bowel movement for 24 to 48 hours. Specifically with glycerin suppositories, we'll talk a little bit about per, per rectum treatments later on in the episode, but this is not a therapy I recommend routinely for constipation, only if there hasn't been a bowel movement already for at least two days. So in children greater than six months who have started solids, I like to take a really detailed history about what they're eating. And if they're really struggling with constipation for at least a couple of weeks now, I usually recommend avoiding the white foods. Those are going to be things like rice, bread, pasta, and milk. Milk can actually be an incredibly big trigger for children with constipation. 
as well as a fan favorite food, bananas, um, especially ripe bananas, tend to produce a sticky substance that are, is extremely constipating. So again, kind of looking at those food groups um, and specifically thinking about limiting or cutting back on things like cow's milk and bananas. Some parents, um, when I talk about cow's milk, are a little bit concerned about vitamin D um, and calcium sources when they reduce the cow's milk, but there's tons of other great sources of vitamin D and calcium out there as well. Secondly, I usually like to recommend starting um, juice, which can be a really nice natural um, form of a uh, way to get sorbitol into your diet, which is actually a stimulant for the gut. Um, and sugar can also be used as what's called an osmotic diuretic. It helps pull water into the GI tract and keep those stools nice and loose and easy to pass. Specifically, those juices that contain sorbitol are going to be things like apple, pear, and prune juice. And they usually recommend starting off with about four ounces a day, up to twice a day, depending on the age of the child. Um, and again, I kind of think about, you spend a lot of time talking to parents about avoiding juice. But in this case, I'm actually usually telling parents we're using juice in this case as actually a, a pharmacotherapy for the treatment of constipation. So that's why I give very specific dose recommendations. I, again, either apple, pear, prune, and about typically four ounces a day. I also like to talk to parents um, a little bit about normal exercise routine when we're dealing with constipation. Good normal daily exercise can, he can help those bowels mo keep moving regularly. So that's an important component. And last, but certainly not least, I spend a lot of time talking to parents about what I call bowel training. Your gut needs to be sometimes trained to stool regularly to help, again, keep that rectum um, nice and shrunk down so that your child actually gets the message that their rectal vault is full and being stretched and that it's time to take a poo. So I usually, again, recommend all parents and children to watch the Poo and You video just to get a good idea about how this works. And then bowel training for me, the recommendation I usually make is to have your child sit on the toilet 30 minutes after they eat a meal. So 30 minutes around after you eat food, you have something called the gastrocolic reflex, which your, your stomach empties and it makes you feel like you need to have a poo. So it's the time where you're most likely to be successful in training your child's bowel. So 30 minutes after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I recommend that the children sit on the toilet, depending on their age, um, in a good toileting position. So their knees flexed and their hips up and their feet on the ground um, so that you you know, depending on your child's age, you may want to use a stool or a squatty potty um, to help them get into good positioning. And this is the most important part of constipation treatment is kind of this bowel training. Lastly, I want to talk a little bit about pharmacotherapy or medication treatments for children with constipation. So a big question I always get from parents is the per rectum treatments or the suppositories. I really only recommend treatment per rectum if there is significant pain or signs of fecal infection. And that's because repetitive use of per rectum treatments can lead to more withholdings, especially in those school age children, um, and make their constipation worse, as well as glycerin suppositories in infants can irritate the rectum, again, which may lead to more withholding. So I tried, this also goes out, by the way, for a rectal stimulation. Some um, parents have told me they're using a rectal thermometer to make their baby go. Again, you want to avoid repetitive pro-rectal treatments because it can potentially make constipation worse. If, however, a child is in significant pain or they have signs of fecal impaction, which are going to be um, things like not having a stool for several days might be a sign of fecal impaction, um, having a history of what's called ankylparesis. So you can, when you have a big uh, fecal impaction or rectal um, impacted stool, you can leak stool around it. So they might be having smears in their diaper or in their underpants. Um, stool in the rectum on digital exam or on the rectum on um, imaging like an abdominal x-ray. Or if you can actually feel a big rectal stool vault on physical exam in their belly, those are all symptoms of fecal impaction, at which point I would say it is appropriate to potentially use a prorectum treatment. And that treatment, again, is going to depend on the child's age. For children less than one, usually we're using something like a glycerin suppository. Over one, you should really be going away from the glycerin suppository 
I usually recommend an oral saline enema or a mineral oil enema. I try to um, avoid the use of fleet or sodium phosphate enemas in children, especially those less than two and those with a history of renal failure, because some of that phosphate can be absorbed by your bowel, leading to high levels of phosphate in the blood, which can be dangerous. So again, usually I opt for in less than one, a glycerin suppository, those who are greater than one, um, and less than two, normal saline enema, and those who are older than two, either normal saline or mineral oil enema. After we've done a prorectum treatment or in a child who um, has not needed a prorectum treatment but uh, has constipation, I like to talk to parents about what I call maintenance medications. So these are medications um, that a child should be on at least for two months. And then after they've had good consistent stools for at least another month after that, we can talk about weaning them off their maintenance medications. For those patients who are less than a year old and less than 10 kilos, maintenance medication for me is usually going to be lactulose. Um, and again, the dose is going to depend on their weight. For children who are greater than 10 kilos or greater than a year old, usually my first line medication is going to still be lactulose uh, because it's not a, a large volume that is needed to be treated um, or polyethylene glycol, also called Miralax. Those are kind of my first two choices, and the choice really depends a little bit on the patient and the family. So if a patient can't tolerate large volumes of water, um, usually I recommend polyethylene glycol or Miralax. Um, otherwise, um, lactulose is a good alternative as well. Second line medications, I only recommend if a child has had um, is on a first line medication and still having symptoms or if they required a prorectum treatment because they were having significant pain or fecal infection. So those second line medications are gonna be things like Senna or Bistiacol. Um, and usually, again, these medications need to be continued for at least five to seven days after fecal clean out to make sure that that rectum has shrunken back um, and is on the right path to bowel training and recovery and healing. And now I just want to take a moment actually to talk about some really common constipation myths that I hear either in um, other physicians recommending or other providers recommending or parents ask me about. So the first one is um, my favorite one is actually drink more water. So actually, this has not been shown to treat or even prevent constipation. So there was a randomized control trial that randomized drinking more water to juice and found that it wasn't beneficial. So no, you do not need to make your child drink more water, but they should drink the appropriate normal amount of fluids. But making them drink water above that normal amount is probably not helpful and is um, not something you necessarily need to burden yourself with. Two is eating more fiber. And mostly we're talking about insoluble fiber here. So not only has it not been shown to treat constipation, but it actually can make constipation worse. So tons of times, again, I see parents come in and they say, I was worried about constipation, so I started my child on, you know, fiber supplements, um, and they're not getting better. So sometimes what can actually happen is insoluble fiber is stool bulking, so it can make that stool even larger and bigger, and therefore harder to pass, inadvertently worsening constipation. So those are kind of two myths I like to debunk right at the beginning of a, par uh, um, of a kind of, of a parent coming in with concerns about constipation. So again, today we talked a little bit about some of my thoughts on initial treatment for children with constipation. I hope that you find this episode um, empowering and helpful to you. If your child, if you're concerned that your child does have constipation, I really encourage you to reach out to your pediatrician, your healthcare provider, empower yourself with some of this knowledge, become ready to ask questions. Um, and if you have any questions or concerns, as usual, please leave them below. Thank you for watching the Beehive Doc Talks with Dr. Blair Rolnick. For more episodes and her practice, visit BeKindPediatrics.com. And don't forget to subscribe for more parenting tips wherever you get your podcasts. This information is for educational purposes only. It is not medical advice. Always seek medical advice from a qualified physician.